Hello students, we are gathered here to discuss environment in the context of early Indian history. Now this is a very complex issue and involves taking recourse to different kinds of perspectives and different kinds of sources. For this we need long and deep discussions and here I have my student Chirantani Dash who will help us in understanding and rolling on into the discussion. Now Chirantani, you know there are different kinds of approaches so far as history of environment is concerned. One approach would be to look at the actual environment in which past societies had thrived or got extinguished in the processes due to natural and man-made disasters. Now for that we have to involve a lot of different kinds of researchers taking recourse to multidisciplinary orientation using such investigative tools for example palynological, climatic, hydrological, geological researches. You were talking about this uh, a multidisciplinary approach. Now as a student of history I would like to know that what is a purely historical angle to look at the problem. Yeah, uh, you see history is to do with human beings Yeah, and in order to understand human concerns about environment, we have to look into the sources which are related, which reflect how human beings had engaged in the past with their own surroundings. Now every society has recorded their experiences of the nature, their uh, environment and the natural disasters in their own ways and ancient Indian history is no exception. You see basically we have to understand that it is the human concern for existence and better existence in their natural surroundings which led to such human engagements with nature and environment and this is reflected in practical ways also. So nature has been looked at as a source of sustenance, as a source of resources for life, as well as one setup within which human life thrives. Right. So ma'am, you want to say that there was no uniform way to look at the issue. There was no homogeneous way to look at the issue. Uh, that means uh, they looked at the things at different ways. Naturally, because we find that we are looking at a society which traversed a very big time temporal as well as spatial zone. Different kinds of societies, different kinds of sections within the societies would engage with environment in different ways. You know, And it, it all arose out of the practical necessity of human beings in their daily, daily life. Okay. In the, in the early Indian context, we have to also understand the fact that the kind of anxieties that human society is facing today in the 21st century would not have been there. Right. Because nowadays, the, the kind of depletion of the ozone layer or the natural forest cover that has led to this kind of concerns was not there. So population was at its minimum. Lifestyles were so simple that uh, exploitation of nature was at its minimum. So the considerations that were there were actually for betterment of life and nature and environment was the best resource that human being had. We find that more of an orientation of exploitation of nature that we find. But also on the other hand, especially in the early Indian context among the all the earliest civilizations, we find that there was uh, the evolution of a philosophy of nature, of a conception of man in nature vis-a-vis -vis man and nature. Right. Okay. So nature and environment was integral to human existence. That was also understood in the early Indian scope of you know, engagements. So these sources, can they be categorized? I mean, yes, yes, they can be categorized. For example, I think I have been able to categorize uh, about three or four different uh, perspectives in different kinds of sources. The first perspective would be the philosophical perspective. Right. 
okay, relating to nature as a symbol of the heaven in which human and animal world thrived. Okay, so that we get from the Vedic Samhitas, for example, in the Upanishads, in the Buddhist and Jaina canonical texts, as well as in the philosophical schools like uh, Vaisesika and Sankhya, Sankhya Sutras. Okay, that is the first category. Secondly, we have a very practical category uh, that is related to administration and you know political directives. Arthashastra. Okay, that we get from Arthashastra and other texts of course, but Arthashastra actually covers the subject so well that we do not really need to traverse beyond it. Yeah. So that is the second category. And the third category would be, you know, the, this is very interesting, the medical texts. How, what kind of concern do we get f from this angle of medical science? Uh, if we don't call it science, then of course we can talk, it, talk about Ayurveda. Human health and environment the relationship, the correlations, okay. So that is the third kind of text. The fourth kind of text would be uh, the lexicons right. in which we find the reflections of man's requirement to graph environment for their daily ritualistic and astrological purposes as well as in order to evolve into a knowledge system too about nature. And that we get on the one hand from Brihat Sanghita and on the other from Amarakosa. So these few texts uh, could be representative of the myriads of ways in which human mind had engaged with nature. Uh, nature. So ma'am, can you please elaborate a bit more on this philosophy of on nature? Yes, uh, you see, in uh, both in the Vedic Sanghitas as well as in Buddhism and Jainism, we find that there was uh, the burgeoning of a philosophy in which nature is actually emerging as omnipotent force. So we have, for example, for the first time probably in the history of mankind, the concept of a universal law of nature in the Rig Veda, conceived of as Rita. Rita. And this has been enlarged upon in the Buddhist philosophy also. And later on from this Buddhist philosophy, which is which we find in the Dikhanikaya section of Chakravati Sihananda Suttanta, okay, where we find that the, uh, uh, the law of nature, there is a universal law of nature, which is the Dhamma, the concept, the basic, uh, the core of Dhamma. And then again we find later on in the Shalini how there was the conception of Pancha Niyama, okay, of within which we find there is one which is the Bija Niyama, the second which is the Ritu Niyama. From this we find that there was uh, the, the emergence of the idea that nature was the controlling force of sustenance of the universe. Then again we have also other concepts in the Buddh in Buddhist and Jaina sources about non-violence, okay? Yeah, ma'am, everyone knows that non-violence is a very core concept to Buddhism and Jainism. So is that also related to the conceptualization of nature and something to do with nature? Uh, I think it is more to do with how uh, these heretic, it is generally called that these are heretic religions because they did not conform to the, to the Vedic uh, yoga and rituals okay so to break away from that format this is a kind of a reaction against the profound killings of animals and uh, you know felling of trees and other things which was conducted in the pro process of, a, of of performing a yoga in the in the brahmanical rites so as a reaction to that there is this uh, heavy preponderance on non violence but that also stems from this feeling of probably uh, the sustenance of all creatures equally in the universe. So they believed in the equal rights of yes, every living yes, creature. Yes, they believed in this and in fact uh, we find in the Samjukta Nikaya that uh, uh, non-harm to all creatures, living creatures was a fundamental rule of the followers in Buddhism and that was also very true for Jainism. Right. 
again in the Kutadanta Sutta for example we find that how Buddha had propounded that he was only for those kind of sacrifices in which there would be no felling of trees no killing of animals nor even mowing down of grass for the purposes of the sacrifice so these are certain things which of course relate to the concept of nature and non-violence so ma'am this is the uh, literary portion or the philosophical portion i just want to know uh, can we see the reflection of ahimsa or non-violence even in the artistic expressions too not exactly as non-violence or ahimsa but what we find in the art and especially in the early form of art which is related to buddhism the, and the idea of religion was transpiring into the artistic forms that there was this philosophy of the continuum continuum between the uh, animal and the natural world and the cognizance that human life and creature all the creatures were nurtured within the ma macrocosm of universe in uh, an environmental orbit okay and this probably leads to the idea of uh, envisioning the bodhisattva paddopani for example in the ajanta paintings as standing in the midst of uh, the oceans at the bottom the nether worlds at the bottom and the heaven at the top and the creatures world in between so this continuum of life uh, within which the the essence of human being and also the essence of godhead was in visualized so this is what is at the core of indian art too now this starts with the buddhist art but later on it also is continued in other uh, sectarian arts too ma'am do we find any practical approach to nature especially related to uh, human uh, society in Arthashastra? Yes, especially because Arthashastra is a, a kind of a handbook for the rulers. So it, it contains a lot of suggestions about how a king should rule his kingdom. And naturally, uh, this, this text, the main portions that we are including for discussion here, uh, were said to be composed at about the same time when the Mauryas came to power. And you see at that time in the middle Ganga valley, that region, a lot of farming settlements were um, organizing themselves into revenue earning sources. And based on that kind of uh, economic basis, foundations, Maurya empire was getting built up slowly. So therefore, uh, in the Arthashastra we find a kind of a tone which actually is a very exploitative tone. Uh, looking out for natural resources and to in order to garner the natural resources for practical uses. So we find directives for arranging human settlements with clear demarcations, exact calculation of population in these settlements and the exact area utilizing the natural resources and the natural formations were used for demarcations. That was very interesting. Again for uh, the settlement of Durga for example, the fort, fortified settlements, uh, uh, there was a directive that uh, the natural spots which were impregnable by enemies were to be chosen specifically. For example, at the confluence of rivers with a moat, surrounding moat, or uh, at the center of uh, uh, hills, okay, which would be not okay. penetrable. Again, in the midst of a very deep forest or in the midst of deserts. So these kinds of uh, uh, different directives are coming which relate to the nature, the strategic position relating to the environment as well as to the human concern for uh, settlements. So this is there. So okay. you want to say that there were the guidelines to utilize the natural resources in the Atashastra. Exactly. And also you see uh, for example we find in the, in the town planning section for example we find that a no number of rules have been integrated uh, which look towards civic atmosphere. Right. So building up, nurturing a civic atmosphere like specific plans for housing, these are given. So these kinds of rules actually reveal that there was a lot of concern for good living conditions within settlements.
this is the literary portion i just want to know is there any archaeological data corroborating to this the building up of the capital city of the harjanka rulers in girivraja or rajagriha it is an ideal spot which refers back to the giridurga of arthashastra it is impregnable almost surrounded by seven small hills next uh, also we find that the settling setting up of uh, kumrahar or patliputra at the confluence of ganga and son is also very interesting it actually perhaps developed from a dronamukha type of settlement which is again uh, prescribed in the arthashastra is there any concern regarding the natural disasters in the arthashastra yeah we have uh, not only in arthashastra we have other evidences also uh, famines and epidemics have been mentioned in arthashastra in very indirect way in case of famine it has been advised that the king should be giving away uh, anugraha which is actually exemption from pay, pay, paying taxes to those who were affected by this this is corroborated by one inscription which was found from mahasthangar in bagura district of bangladesh which was issued under the mauja rulers this actually contained a reference to a famine that had taken place and the king's instructions to open the gates of the royal storage of grains for the affected people so we have an good interesting uh, corroboration again famine has been referred to in 7th century uh, text of periya puranam in the case of in, in the region of tanjore in south india famines have also been referred in brihat sanhita for example and epidemics of course we uh, we hear of epidemics have, uh, in in case of in the in the uh, medical texts as well as in arthashastra also in uh, uh, brihat sanhita okay so these are very interesting points which we find graft floods are also there in fictional literature also we get reference to floods repeated floods taking away the whole settlement we have uh, uh, archaeological evidence for flooding okay so these are all there for us to actually go down to the sources and find out ma'am uh, you just talked about the disasters now naturally the question comes this was there any concern for conservation or preservation of nature yes uh, uh, for example we have uh, uh, ideas of planting trees uh, it is very famously known the uh, ashoka edict number 1 major rock edict on number 1 it prescribes uh, it actually says uh, claims that uh, shady trees were planted on thoroughfares for the benefit of human beings and animals uh, again we in the arthashastra we have references to such plantations of trees in the later day uh, architectural treatises it has been mentioned specifically to uh, plant deciduous perennial trees in around the homestead grounds again in brihat sanhita we have similar prescriptions so there were incidences of plantation of trees but i have my doubts about whether there was any idea about afforestation as such it was all done for human benefit okay mm. uh, um, on the other hand there is one singular very piece of uh, one piece of uh, interesting evidence coming from the ashokan pillar edict 5 in which there are specific species of animals birds and fishes mentioned which were supposed to be not viable they were not supposed to be killed and it has been reiterated in the arthashastra too at the end result we have is some sort of a indirect uh, approach towards conservation of some species and some species of trees also we find that in general there was also an exploitative attitude towards natural resources so it's it's a kind of a very interesting myriad of reflections that we have about uh, the brihat sanhita i would like to say that this text the rituals the astrological pronouncements related to the stellar and temporal positions of the stars which were pronounced to be auspicious for certain things or pronouncing the occurrence of heavy rainfall or imminent rainfall or earthquake uh, uh, according to the astrological and astronomical positions these actually stem from uh, the inner anxiety of human beings Right. coming out of the dependence utter dependence on of the human nature. society on natural forces for example we have a lot of discussion about earthquakes okay the most interesting thing is that uh, natural forces have been uh, pinpointed as having caused these earthquakes 
and these are the deified natural forces for example vayu and indra and agni and varuna are said to be the four primary forces causing earthquakes in different zones but what comes out is the uh, the the minute level of observation about earthquake even tectonic movements are related as if it is kind of a herculean or under ocean movement which gives rise to earthquake so some kind of an understanding had evolved which was not scientific but based purely on experience and observation in the medical text there is a grave concern for human health as well as the health of natural resources due to imbalances in nature both in the charaka and the susruta sanghita we find uh, elaborate chapters devoted to the discussions of seasons and especially both seasons in their natural conditions and unnatural or abnormal conditions of seasons and it has been specifically mentioned that every season would give rise to certain diseases a clinical observation okay right. but on the other hand it is also mentioned that in abnormal conditions of seasons abnormal diseases did occur okay and there is a reference to epidemics in this sense there is it is told that epidemics occur due to the abnormal conditions of water or air or soil and it is also said that human beings in affected area should not partake or uh, a kind of drink this water they should leave the space and go to some new area to settle down but along with this kind of practical and rational observation there is the idea that it is a commitment of sin on behalf of a whole community or the king that had led to this kind of epidemics ma'am was the issue of uh, nature and environment ever brought into the paradigm of uh, learning and knowledge in ancient india yes uh, actually it's very interesting you see uh, there are two ways of looking at it one is uh, learning you know uh learning of course uh, there was one parameter of learning about the astrological and astronomical positions which we get from uh, brihat sanghita for example natural phenomena in its many uh, senses and many forms were also uh, uh, sought to be known and explored by aryabhata so astronomy was a big subject which was taking care of this kind of gathering of knowledge and information but there was also a paradigm of uh, knowledge regarding geography and uh, plants uh, the paradigm of plant world was uh, sought to be known by the ayurvedic practitioners because they were handling plant resources for medicinal purposes but if you take the idea of nature and environment per se into a knowledge paradigm then i think the best genre which we find is in amarakosa right it is a lexicon and it actually contains the categories that are there in nature in the human world in animal world and in natural world in which there are certain uh, sections totally devoted to geological formations you know different kinds of natural formations and natural resources also so ma'am you want to say that it's a kind of approach where the common man at least have some knowledge on the natural sciences exactly you see outside the purview of the astronomers scientists etc amarakosa actually packs the knowledge for the common people right it is not for the use of the administrators for exploitative purpose it is not for the use of brahmin priests or others it is for knowledge per se to be accessed by the average man who had access to knowledge right. at that time because we know that knowledge was restricted to certain sections of the society but to whoever the knowledge was accessible amarakosa provided information regarding nature and environment and that information was gathered from different avenues from different expert groups who were handling that knowledge who had given names to these specific forms of nature and of geographical features so these have been collected and put in the form of a lexicon this gives a total perspective of the knowledge paradigm regarding or vis-a-vis -vis nature and environment 
with that can we say that we come to the conclusion of the discussion about nature and environment uh, as engaged to by uh, the early Indian society. <laughs>